All right, where is Pastor Dave? We are supposed to be recording. Why does he do this to me every single time? I don't understand. Oh, wait, there's a note. To Sonia, let's see what it says. During this time of quarantine, I'm really not trying to be mean. Being alone, not causing a flap, I'm in the place where Lynn takes a nap. Okay, I think I know where that is. Let's go see where Lynn takes a nap. And as we're walking through, look at all the lovely pictures on the wall. <laughs> Let's see, where is he at? Where does Lynn take a nap? Hmm. Uh, if Lynn takes a nap in there, I'm not going in there. Let's see, maybe it's someplace else. Hopefully that's not the right room. I think it might be in here. Oh, I think we're in the right place. Come in. Hey, welcome to Volume 2 of Quarantine Chronicles. We're certainly glad that you uh, made it again tonight. And we're going to begin studying a very important character in Bible history. And for me, it's always exciting to study about uh, Bible characters because, first of all, it leaves me in admiration. I read the stories of these men and what great deeds that they did, and I think, wow, if I could only have faith like that. And then also, it, it kind of leaves me reproved. I mean, if God can use them, then most certainly he could use you and me to accomplish what he wants. And it also leaves me without excuse. I mean... It, he took people from poor sections, people who were farmers, people who were uh, wanderers, people who were sheep herders, and he used them to do great things. But it also leaves us with hope. Hope in the fact that we can do what God wants us to do. Now, we have to understand, sometimes we forget that Bible characters were real people. You know, we live in the world of superheroes and comic books and CGI movies and, and they can do anything and everything. And then we read about some of the exploits of these Bible characters and we just kind of stop and think and say, well, just another adventure story. But it's not. These are events that really happened. And we're going to look at the life of Elijah and just kind of take a, a few principles that he has for us through the time that he appears in the scriptures in the book of 1 Kings. Elijah was a real person and he lived in a time and in a culture that really seems a lot like ours, and we really can't understand what Elijah was going through and why he did what he did until we understand a little bit about the culture. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse number 30, we read these words. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbael, king of the Sidians. And he went to serve Baal and worshipped him. And so he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. 
Wow. We live in this culture that says, God? What do we need God for? And here is a nation, much like ours, that has moved far from God. And then all of a sudden, this guy, Elisha, he just jumps on the scene. We don't know much about him. We don't know really anything about him, except the fact that in 1 Kings 17.1, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, surely there will neither be dew or rain these years, except by my word. Wow, did that guy have guts. All of a sudden, the guards are around, everybody's around, the king is going through his thing, and then boom, there's Elijah, and he stands right up, and he points his finger right at the king, and he goes, listen, king, this is what's going to happen because God says so. Now, it's never easy to take a stand for God in good conditions, much less when you're going through chaos like we are nowadays. And in the middle of this pandemic, it would be very easy for us just to hunker down and keep our mouth shut and our heads low. But oh, what an open door we have for sharing the gospel in these rough times. Well, you say, Pastor Dave... Where am I going to get that kind of courage? Well, I'll tell you where you're going to get it. You're going to get it from the same place that Elijah got it. And in this one verse, he shows us three ways we need to think to be effective in communicating the gospel to our generation in these tough times. Now, we're just going to look at the first one tonight. But it's a very, very important principle that you need to remember. And that is this. Elijah was convinced in the reality of Jehovah. That's what it says. As the Lord God of Israel lives. You see, in our culture... We are presented with so many different idols to worship because the devil wants people to believe that the true God is just one among many. He's just an option, and if you want to go that way, you can. We see all of these different kinds of idols that are built, and, and sometimes as Christians we're drawn that way towards prosperity, towards materialism, towards fame towards building up ourselves and making ourselves to be something that we're not. But Elijah knew these idols were false. He knew that they couldn't bring satisfaction or peace or even relationship. And so he comes to Ahab and he says, As the Lord God of Israel lives. You have to be convinced of that. You see... The world is not impressed with our arguments. And we can have them all down as we talk to people about why we believe in God. And a lot of people are saying, hey, where is God in all of this? And, and how come he's not doing something? Why should I believe in a God? And we can go A, B, C, right down the line on why we believe in God and how uh, creation proves it and all of these things. But that doesn't impress people because they have just as many arguments of why it's not true. Well, they're also not impressed with our successes. They don't really care how big our church is or, or how wonderful we are and, and being blessed by God and, and how He has prospered us. There is only one way that the lost world is convinced and impressed. They can only be convinced by what they cannot explain. And that's the power of Christianity. 
the power of Christianity to change lives, and that is something only that God can do. Yesterday, when President Trump carried uh, or brought about all of these great business leaders that uh, run the corporations of America, one of the first guys that he had stand up, we recognize him from television, Mike Lindell. You say, well, I don't recognize the name. Well, he's the My Pillow guy, and his face is all over the place. I have one of his pillows. It's pretty good. But most of us don't know the background of Mike Lindell. And if you had read just what the media said about him, oh, he wants us to pray out of this, and he wants us to just read the Bible and trust God, and oh, he complimented the president. He, he's just a whack job. But see, what you don't understand, that Mike Lindell came from a, a, a very rough background. When he was 10 years old, his parents divorced, and uh, he lived in a split home, split between mom and dad, and, and he took to drinking when he was 14 years of age. He nominally went to church, and he believed in God, but never changed his life. And as he grew older, he got into drugs, he got into hard drugs. As a matter of fact, he was big time into cocaine. And it was a funny thing because he would tell the people he was doing cocaine with about what God could do for them. But somehow he never appropriated it for himself. And then one day, after he'd been on a cocaine high for 14 days in a row, one of his friends came by that he hadn't seen in about a year. And and he confronted him and he said, you know what, Mike, a year ago you told me to believe in God and I received Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And he says, and that's what you need. And he helped him to get dry and he took him to a camp. And there he sat with one of the counselors. And she said, you know what, Mike, you need a change in your life. And he got all defensive and said, hey, I believe in God, I can, I can take care of it, you know, and God's not helping me even though I believe in him. And she says, no, it's not a matter of just believing in God. You need to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And there in that little camp office, he bowed his head and received Christ as his Savior, and his life was changed. And he became a proponent, not of my pillow, but of what Jesus Christ could do for you and what it did for him. Folks, that's what the world wants to see. They don't want us talking about our Christianity and not living it. They don't want to think that, hey, he's no different than I am. Because with Christ, we are different. And that's what they believe, that Christ is has made a supernatural change in your life. You know, I think it's very interesting that when things are not going well, we'll start to pray and we'll say, Lord, please change my spouse. Lord, please change my kids. Lord, please change my boss. And we pray like that and Nothing seems to change. You know, we need to pray differently. Because it's amazing how hard it is for the Lord to break through in our lives in certain situations until we start praying correctly. What we need to pray is, Lord, change me. Change me. I surrender. Make me to be what you want me to be. Because you see, if you really want to convince people that God is real and that He's real in your life, you must show His aliveness in your life and what He is doing in your life. Because it is His work to produce the change. We can't do it. Hey, do you really want to convince people that God is real? Then you need to be real and believe 
and be convinced of the reality of God in your life. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you, and it's easy to talk about God. It's easy to say we believe in God. But if we really want to make a difference, we have to show people that God lives in us, and he's changing us and making us to be what he wants us to be. I pray that you'd help us to do that. I pray that you would help us as we study Elijah's life, that we would learn some of these principles and incorporate them into how we live. Lord, I pray that you'd bless all that are watching this. I pray that you'd help them through these tough times. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we'll see you next week when we present part three of Quarantine Chronicles.